introduction I needed. <laughs> Someday Felicia is going to win a Nobel Prize and then maybe you'll know that I also encouraged her to write, but you guys will know the real story. <laughs> um, the last third of the show is called, Is Queer for the Young? <laughs> and um, so I'll, I'll read this piece uh, that I wrote called Anarchist Love Child Assimilates. <laughs> Twenty years ago, I was standing outside Cafe Red, flirting with a blind, older butch. And by older, I'm thinking now that she was in her mid-thirties. <laughs> I, a decade younger at the time. I couldn't quite imagine how someone who couldn't see me would be attracted to me. As if I were all surface and vision only, costume and cleavage and come-hither looks despite my penchant for words and some abstract belief that we are more than our appearances. I wanted something from the blind butch besides her attention anyway. I wanted to know, where are the older fans? I wanted a peek into my own future, one I couldn't find on television or in movies really or even in many books. Who would I, could I become? The older fans weren't in the clubs. Every once in a while you'd spot one in a vintage dress with out of style shoes on, glorying in a night out. But mostly they stayed away. Where had they gone? The blind boy snorted. Home watching videos, she said. They're all home watching videos. <laughs> I remember asking Michelle T about growing up a few years later. I'd just moved to New York with my then girlfriend, mostly because my previous girlfriend had once moved to New York for me, disastrously, and it seemed like karma that I was being asked to do the same. I became unmoored. I'd wake up in the night with the hollow feeling I'd stepped off my life path. Interviewing Michelle T for the Lambda Literary Review, I asked her about growing up. Did she think or worry about it or, or wonder what it would look like? We were both about 29. <laughs> She said something like, I have a 19-year-old girlfriend. I don't think I'll ever have to grow up. <laughs> now she's written at least two books about growing up and the apocalypse. <laughs> Most of my ideas about adult life came not from my parents, who neither mastered nor modeled maturity, marriage, stability, or home life. <laughs> As a child, I had fantasies of being Laura Ingalls Wilder's mother. Capable quick hands making food, clothes, turning a half underground sod house into a white walled home. <laughs> Though admittedly, in these imaginings, my best friend always lived right next door to me with her vaguely sketched in husband, she and I raising our children together. <laughs> my point is, at the breakfast and dinner tables of my Berkeley childhood, we talked about gender change and neutral pronouns, about feminism and civil rights, nuclear war and economic justice, the family history history of the witch hunts of McCarthyism and the horrors of the Holocaust, but few in my family got married, certainly not for keeps. When Angie and I finally got together after 12 years of flirtatious friendship, Kendra took me aside and said, Angie is someone to have an affair with, not a relationship. <laughs> the same, no doubt, could have been said for me, but it's been 13 years. We live in a ranch house, on a street of ranch houses on a cul-de-sac that ends in a field where I've seen a fox and a snake. You can't be pushy or aggressive while you're driving in this small town because you'll peer through the reflection of the window glass and realize it's your neighbor or the head of school or the person who bags groceries at the store, all of whom you know. Angie and I are, for the political time being, at least to all intents and purposes and surprisingly legally, married. We're not watching videos exactly, but we do stream shows. We have two kids and a dog. We had two guinea pigs, but the dog killed them. <laughs> Suburbia has its dark side. I'm not the first to say it. <laughs> but we also have cherry trees, peach trees, an apple and a plum in our backyard. They bloom like the girls peeling out of the clubs for fresh air and a cigarette. Being 20-something and queer in San Francisco in the 90s felt like being famous. We'd try on a thousand dresses, swapping outfits and raising the stakes until we burst into the night together, parading toward the roving club, performing and watched. It felt like that, visible and shimmering, a joint project of creating ourselves, a collaboration with the world. We were in love with something that wasn't supposed to exist. Unicorns everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
That kind of visibility is the opposite of being a suburban mom. It's not so much that I'm invisible now, as that I'm not performing, I'm not checking to see if I'm reflected back and how in other people's eyes. I no longer wonder how someone will relate to me if they can't see the dress I wore or the way I wore it. But I also move through the world with secret knowledge. What I learned about my body in the 90s in queer San Francisco helped me give birth, for example. And what I learned about gender has been a keystone to parenting two human beings in the face of the constant painful limitations put on them by outside notions of gender, and also to help their queer transgender friends and their friends' parents who are, you know, the, the elementary school is full of queer trans people. It's the other place where gender is getting played out. What I learned about human need and human desire, about the distance one can shove or erase between them, turned me into a writer. So how did I get from there to here? The writers say bird by bird, the addicts say one day at a time. On the good days, and there are a lot of good days, I call it luck. join us in person, but she made a video, and so we get to go into her kitchen, and it's wonderful. Um, this is just for us. And um, Rika is the author of, uh, sorry, sorry, it's the author. <laughs> um, Rika is the author of Seasonal Velocities, Himela Ahilo, Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon This Soul, and she's also an English professor. So, 
you know, when I was asked to be part of trajectories, you know, they, they said, well, why don't you talk to the younger trans women? But really, I drive a Honda with 326,000 miles on it, and I don't have anybody right now in my life that I can say, uh, you know, I love you uh, just before I fall asleep. Maybe my mother if I call her. But, um, so I'm, I'm just kind of struggling through my way. But I wanted to do this because so much of trans is not, well, I shouldn't say it's not correct, but it's, it's, it's a show. We're, we're used to, we're used to um, having to put on a performance to be either accepted as, as human or as, um, or as female. Um, and I've just found out that most performances end, and that there's a time to be off stage, and that that could be 12 years long, and it can leave you with this feeling that you're completely alone. And uh, so I'm dealing with that right now. And it's been really interesting figuring out what stays, because frankly, I don't want to spend the rest of my life mourning what's past. Thea reached out to me, Thea Hellman reached out to me, and asked me to be part of this, and I realized that my friends have really been part of my permanence, my, my ability to, to stay in this world. Um, it's not so much the art, it's not so much the books. What it really is is feeling that I'm part of a tapestry, that I'm part of a, a group of people that love each other and are greater themselves. Maybe not romantic love, maybe maybe I won't have that in my life, I don't know. But um, there's a sense of belonging. Yeah. Here, let me share some pictures. <laughs> this, this is my grandma. And um, I miss her very much. I kind of burn incense for her every night and Gosh, this is so unscripted, but check this out, check this out. <laughs> she got me this really cool snow cone machine that I keep. I think I got this from 10 years old or something. And it puts ice in here, and the snow cones come out of it. And I'm 52, and I still make snow cones that my, because it helps me remember things uh, from my grandmother. Um, and beyond that, there's her family and, you know, her parents. Um, check this out. <laughs> this knife um, came from Japan. It belonged to my great grandmother. I use this every day. It's it's my main cooking knife, and you can see here how the blade is kind of like worn away uh, from all the grinding. Um, it, this has been used for you know over a hundred years. And when I use this, I feel very very connected to my parents and my. My grandparents and my family, you know, we've got my father, my great grandfather, when he set up house, um, my great grandmother didn't have any kitchenware, so he made this out of sheet metal and he pounded this in. And if I look really closely, I can see the hammer marks in here. And each of those hammer marks was an expression of my great grandfather's life. You can also see it here in this fish scaler, which, if you look behind, has been broken and mended because that was a time when we didn't buy new things, we fixed them. I say we, and um, that we is so powerful because it moves me to people and to places. I think as I get older, the trajectory I'm beginning to find is that permanent things stay permanent. One gets old enough to figure that out. Um, and friends and that you make, they have far, far less to do with being queer or trans, and they have far, far more to speak their actions. So that's kind of what I just wanted to talk about, just a little bit. And I wish you all the best. Much love.